Hi, welcome to episode 46 of the Flying Free Podcast. I am actually recording this podcast and also doing a video at the same time for people on YouTube who like to watch and listen at the same time. And what we're going to be talking about today is one of the most important lessons that I learned in my journey up and out of my abusive relationship, and that is this, how to advocate for myself. This was a very hard lesson for me to learn because I had spent my entire life believing that self-advocacy was evil. Now I really believe that advocacy is a necessary adulting skill that we all need to get better at, not only for our own sake, but also for the sake of our children after us. We can't pass on skills that we are not strong in ourselves. So we want our children to grow up taking responsibility for themselves, making decisions without being afraid, and moving forward with hope and purpose in spite of the obstacles and challenges that they face. But they can't do that, and neither can we, if we aren't able to advocate for ourselves. So what do we need to do to be able to start advocating for ourselves? I think the first thing we need to do is to deprogram from our false core belief that we are a helpless child in need of rescue from someone in authority over us. This is a tough one, isn't it? Women in conservative Christian circles are actually taught that it is godly to be passive. We're not encouraged to learn emotional intelligence skills. So let's talk about five emotional intelligence skills that we really need to learn, but that we're actually prohi almost prohibited from learning in our conservative Christian circles. One of these emotional intelligence skills is self-regard. This is the skill of accepting yourself for who you are, both your strengths and your weaknesses. We also need to learn the, self the emotional intelligence skill of self-actualization. That is the skill of pursuing things that lead to a meaningful life. Thirdly, the emotional intelligence skill of independence. This is being prepared to adopt a course of action while tolerating the disapproval of others who disagree. And then fourth, we need to learn the emotional intelligence skill of assertiveness. This is the ability to respectfully express yourself and stand up for your beliefs and decisions. And finally, we need to learn the emotional intelligence skill of problem solving. And this is the ability to confront problems rather than run away from them. Now, instead, a in, in our conservative Christian circles, a premium is put on women who allow others to control their education, their thoughts, their theology, their decisions, their time, their resources, their gifts, their skills, and their future. The others in religious conservative circles are usually men who believe in a power over theology of male-female relationships. This would include hardcore patriarchy, as well as softcore patriarchy, which is more commonly known as complementarianism. Of course, power over structures like this place women in vulnerable positions where they are easily exploited for wicked purposes, such as the case in every home where there is any kind of abuse happening, such as the case whenever a woman tries to advocate for herself in a religiously controlling and abusive church environment that also teaches a power over theology of male-female relationships. And this is why getting help from a church is so often re-abusive and traumatic. This is something that I write about on my website. The truth is that you were made in the image of God with the same mandate to go forth and take dominion of God's creation as men were. You are also bought by the blood of Jesus Christ and given another mandate to go forth and make disciples. You were given the gift of the Holy Spirit, as well as other gifts to fulfill your purpose as his ambassador in this world. Now, that does not sound like the passive role of a helpless child to me. 
The fact is, God not only gave women these honors and privileges along with men, but he also gave women an incredible responsibility in Genesis 2.18. The English words most often used in modern translations are suitable helper, but this translation doesn't do the actual words justice. The original Hebrew words used in this verse are ezer kenegdo. Ezer is a word used to describe God as a warrior numerous times in the Old Testament, and it's translated to rescue, to save, to be strong. And kenegdo is translated corresponding to. So when God said, I will make a helper suitable for him, Adam, he was saying this. I will make a warrior corresponding to him. That's amazing and quite a difference in translation and meaning. Men didn't need someone to reign over. He needed an equal to reign with. Here's how Carolyn Custis James expands on this rich and beautiful truth in her book called Half the Church, Recapturing God's Global Vision for Women. Like the man, she is also God's creative masterpiece, a work of genius and a marvel to behold, for she is fearfully and wonderfully made. The Ezer never sheds her image bearer identity, not here, not ever. God defines who she is and how she is to live in his world. That never changes. The image bearer responsibilities to reflect God to the world and to rule and subdue on his behalf still rests on her shoulders too. God didn't create the woman to bring half of herself to his global commission or to minimize herself when the man is around. The fanfare over her is overblown if God was only planning for her to do for the man things that he was perfectly capable of doing for himself or didn't even need. The man won't starve without her. In the garden, he doesn't really need anyone to do laundry, pick up after him, or manage his home. If Adam must think, decide, protect, and provide for the woman, she actually becomes a burden on him. Not much help when you think about it. The kind of help the man needs demands full deployment of her strength, her gifts, and the best she has to offer. His life will change for the better because of what she contributes to his life. Now, in the Old Testament, we see examples of God's Ezer Konegdos going into battle for the glory of God. Deborah, Esther, Ruth, Abigail, Rahab, and Hannah, just to name a few. And God's view of women has not changed. When Jesus came to this earth, he lived an unapologetically he lived in an unapologetically patriarchal culture that viewed women as less than men. But he broke all the cultural rules when he talked to women without going through their husbands or fathers, when he gave a Samaritan woman the responsibility to evangelize her hometown, when he invited women to follow him and learn from him, that was something only men were allowed to do with a rabbi, and when he entrusted Mary Magdalene with the very first gospel message. He surrounded himself with women and treated them with honor, fully expecting both women and men to spread the gospel when he was gone. Now, you wouldn't have seen a religious leader doing that back then, but he broke those social norms that divided men and women in order to establish a new kingdom of oneness and unity in himself. After he was gone, you see women receiving the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.17, being released into ministry of every kind. Junia was an apostle, Romans 16.7. Philip's four daughters were prophetesses, Acts 21.9. Udiah and Syntyche were evangelists, Philippians 4.2 and 3. Phoebe was a deaconess, Romans 16.1 and 2. And Priscilla was a pastor teacher, Romans 16.3-5. And Acts 18, 24 to 26. Paul spread this revolutionary message of unity by speaking of men and women together as brothers and sisters. In fact, he refers to both men and women as sons. Now, that's a position viewed as a place of honor in that patriarchal culture. 
this would have been astounding to his audience back then, as it is to many extremely conservative Christian churches today who have all but ignored his teachings. Romans 8, 14 through 17 says, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have received a spirit of adoption as sons and are heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Notice that's not talking to men. It's talking to all who are led by the Spirit of God, both men and women. Here's another reference to this in Galatians 3, 26 and 28. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And 1 Corinthians 14, 39 says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy. Now, think of every verse in the New Testament that talks about our new life as followers of Jesus. Do they distinguish between male and female followers? The vast majority of them do not. Acts 2, 17 to 18 says, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your youths will see visions. Your seniors will dream dreams. Even on my male servants, which was the Greek word for ministers, and on my female servants, again, the Greek word for ministers, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. First Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He wasn't just talking to men there. He's talking to women as well. Revelation 5, 9 through 10, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God people from every tribe and language and people group and nation. This includes both men and women. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Now, the second thing that we need to deprogram from is our core belief that God is going to rescue us if we do nothing when we have the opportunity to actually do something. So the Bible teaches us in many places that God is our rescuer, but how does he rescue us? In the Psalms, we see David fleeing from King Saul as he chases David all over the countryside. But is David standing still, hoping God will rescue him? No, he's running. He runs to the fortress of God. He hides in the shadow of God's wings. He takes refuge. These are all actions. When the life of baby Jesus was being threatened, did Joseph and Mary stay put, trusting God to rescue his son? No, they went into high gear and fled, trusting God even as they did so. They did their part, and they trusted God to do his part according to his will. Do we, as disciples of Jesus Christ, do nothing while hoping God will do his thing in this world? No, we take action because we are the hands and feet of Christ in this world. We carry the Holy Spirit within us, and we bring the kingdom of heaven into the corners of our world through our actions, not our inactions. So when power over theology teaches that women are godly when they are passive, they are telling a lie about God and about the human race. They are believing and teaching a lie that disempowers 50% of the human race in spreading the kingdom of God on this earth. What a tragedy. This is not God's plan for us. I remember begging God to do something about what I was experiencing in my former marriage. I begged him for years and years to help me. But at that, at that same time, I was also choosing to believe a bunch of lies that kept me from doing what I needed to do. He was more than willing to walk with me, to give me wisdom, and to love me through it, but I was unwilling to do what it would take to find hope and healing in my life. 
I was unwilling first to believe that the problem was as bad as it was, and that was a coping mechanism, okay? But I was also unwilling to stand up for what was right and true because it, I knew that if I did, that would cause me a lot of extra pain, and I didn't want that. So God patiently waited. He didn't cause the pain. The sinful choices of human beings caused the pain in my life. But when the pain of staying stuck became greater than the pain of exposing the truth and taking steps to get out, I was finally ready to take action. And I took hold of the first ladder rung out of my pit. And with that first action step, God was right there encouraging me that he would never leave me or forsake me. And I began the difficult journey out. Now, if you're still sitting at the very bottom of that pit, hoping against hope that a miracle will happen and someone will reach down and pull you up so you don't have to make that horrible climb, you're going to be waiting a long time. And here's why. Think about a butterfly trying to emerge from the chrysalis. It is during that struggle that the blood gets pumping through her wings, giving her the wing health and power that she will need to actually fly. If you were to rescue her by cutting open the chrysalis to let her out prematurely, she would die. That's right. She would miss her opportunity to access the power she needs to do. I'm sorry, the power that she needs to do what she was created to do. Her inability to fly will cause her to be easy prey for predators and she will not survive very long. So instead of think, thinking that God is unloving, not to just pluck you out of hell and set your feet on a wide place, you can instead recognize his infinite wisdom in promising to be right by your side every step of the way, loving you, accepting you when you mess up and when you succeed cheering you on no matter what, and then rejoicing over your first flight of freedom when that day comes. God will rescue you, just not the easy pain-free way we'd all wish for. Now, now that we see that our need is to be active participants in our own lives and in the world as God's ambassadors, we need to see how self-advocacy is part of that initiative. If we cannot or are unwilling to advocate for ourselves, we will not be able to effectively advocate for anybody else. To be an advocate is to be strong and responsible. If we're in a compromised position ourselves, that's going to make it difficult to initiate advocacy for others, part of which is teaching them how to self-advocate in healthy ways. Advocating for yourself means aligning yourself with God's agenda for you, not man's. So women get their mail from God, not people. The foundation of everything we believe and do must be grounded in the image of Jesus Christ. His agenda is our agenda. His mission is our mission. He's not afraid of people and their opinions. He wasn't afraid to speak the truth even when it got him into trouble. Even when he was called the son of the devil and he was gossiped about and lied about and hated, he did not surrender himself to human beings. He surrendered himself to God. He stood in the truth about who he was, even though the, it made arrogant, power-hungry religious men gnash their teeth. Those of us who are daughters of the living God can also stand in the truth of who we are, even though it makes arrogant, power-hungry religious men gnash their teeth. We are in good company. We're in the best company. Advocating for yourself also means making friends with yourself. It means not only accepting your humanity, but also embracing your humanity as God's design. To strive for perfection as our abusers and religious communities demand for their pleasure is the original sin. That's right. It's our desire to be godlike. That wasn't God's intention for us. He created us human for a reason, and he called our humanity good in Genesis 131. This is great news. It means that we're free to relax and enjoy our status as God's beloved human daughters. We don't have to be perfect to win his favor, love, and acceptance. 
We are beloved just as we are. What peace and rest and truth that offers us. If God calls us his friends in John 15, 15, can we not also make friends with ourselves? Can we not also treat ourselves with respect and love? The degree to which we accept ourselves in our humanity is the degree to which we will accept others in theirs. So this is a pretty important key to loving others. And we show our love and respect for our creator when we accept his creation of ourselves. This is not evil. This is the opposite of evil. This is one of the important ways that we bring honor to our creator. Satan, on the other hand, hates everything God created, but in particular, he hates human beings. So when we are hating on ourselves and we're making ourselves our number one enemy, we are playing right into the devil's hand. And that, my friends, is evil and brings about a host of evil. Remember that the enemy always flips everything upside down. Opposites. It's fascinating to find them as you, as you deconstruct your theology and let God renovate it from the ground up. Advocating for yourself also means forgiving yourself. How can we forgive others if we can't forgive ourselves? And how are we reveling in God's forgiveness when we cling to our shame and wallow in our regrets? We've all made mistakes, bad decisions, hasty conclusions, foolish moves. We've experienced the consequences of those choices, and we've watched those we love also bear the brunt of the ripple effects of our faulty movements in this world. But this doesn't surprise God or hold him back in any way from telling his redeeming story in our lives. He's a whole lot bigger than that. He has anticipated every wise and every foolish thing we've ever done. And he is able to paint a beautiful picture, not only in spite of the blotches we make on the canvas, but because of them. I don't get it. Who can? It's incredible. And it inspires me to worship him. It also enables me to let go and forgive myself so I can move forward in abandon, choosing to live instead of holding back in fear. If he forgives us, and he does, we are free to forgive ourselves. Okay, advocate, advocating for yourself also means respecting yourself. We respect those we admire, don't we? But th those who do what we wish we could do, if only we had the strength, the courage, the resources, and the power. But for us to grow in self-respect, we actually need to take a step in the direction of putting ourselves out there. We need to stop sitting on the sidelines of life and get in and engage in this life that God gave to us. With each brave step we take, however small it is, we will grow in self-respect. Now, this could be as simple as choosing the color of a new quilt for your bed instead of letting someone else choose it for you. In my book, Is It Me? Making Sense of Your Confusing Marriage, I say this about respect. Respect is being courteous, actively engaging with the other person's hopes and dreams, listening well, caring about the feedback of the other person, paying attention, compromising, asking their opinion, accepting their differences, working toward non-judgment, asking instead of demanding, and basically just treating the other person like they are special and worthy of your regard. You cannot demand respect. It must be freely given for it to be real because respect is born of love and love is given, not taken. To disrespect someone is to ignore their voice, blame and shame them, take power over them, treat them rudely, look down on them, Avoid them. Give them the silent treatment when they don't do what you want them to do. Call them names. Demand obedience. Threaten them and refuse to tolerate their differences. So let's apply this to ourselves now. Are we courteous to ourselves? Or is the committee inside our head always tearing us apart? Do we pay attention to our own gut and give it credibility? Do we believe that we're worthy of regard? Do we shame and blame ourselves, look down on ourselves, call ourselves names, and refuse to tolerate how we're different from other people? 
For you to truly love and respect others, you must begin by loving and respecting yourself. It's the difference between a child who needs the approval of others to know that she is enough and an adult who has the intrinsic understanding of her worth just as she is, as well as the worth of other human beings just as they are. When people are disrespecting you and trying to manipulate you and control and micromanage your life, it's really because they lack a true sense of their own value and worth just as they are. They have to demean and dehumanize and take power over others in order to feel better about themselves. This is childish behavior at best, and it's wicked in its worst form. Respect yourself, and you will naturally gain the respect of other healthy human beings. Advocating for yourself also means making decisions that are healthy for you. When we've lived life going along with the decisions everyone around us is making for our lives, it's easy to believe that this is just how it's supposed to be, and we think we have no choice. But the fact is, we do. They may not all be great choices. They may be hard choices with sticker bushes and pouring rain either way we go, but they are choices, and they are our choices. Sometimes the only choices at first are really hard, but as time goes by and we gain strength and momentum, our choices will open up a bit more and a bit more until we find that we are no longer moving in a cramped room that is two feet by two feet, but instead we are now moving in a wide open space and it's actually a sunny day with a light breeze blowing. Change is not always about huge leaps off of cliffs. Although once in a while, it may feel like that. Change is more about tiny shifts in the way we think and what we do in our everyday lives that add up over time. Never underestimate your power of choice. Advocating for yourself also means using your voice. You knew it was coming. This is what we usually think of when we think of advocating for others. We think of defending ourselves, sticking up for ourselves, speaking our truth. But you know what? Using your voice doesn't have to be super invasive or obnoxious at all. Most of the time, it's just quietly saying what you know to be true and leaving it at that. There's no need to defend your stand. In fact, it's usually better not to. There is far more power in stating your experience or your belief about something and refusing to engage in a futile argument that's going to go nowhere. Our job is not to convince others of what we know to be true. Jesus never did that. He never defended himself to fools. He just did what he came to do quietly, truthfully, in personal strength and power. And some believed him and some didn't. Some killed him and some followed him into paradise. His superpower is your superpower, the superpower of knowing who you are in Christ Jesus and trusting that as you advocate for yourself in these ways, you will grow up into the full stature of your womanhood, thereby fulfilling the destiny you were created for on this earth, to fly free yourself and to model that for the generations after you. Isaiah 58, 14 says, Then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. This episode of the Flying Free podcast is sponsored by the private Flying Free education and support community, which offers courses, workshops, live coaching, and more for women of faith seeking hope and healing from emotionally and spiritually abusive relationships and communities. You can find out more at joinflyingfree.com. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, fly free.